νούμερο σε μένα. Καλημέρα. Ακούγομαι τώρα διπλώς. Έγι από τη δικιά σου, το δικό μου κλείστο, σε παρακαλώ. Μάλιστα. Κάνουμε από εδώ. Οκ. Καλημέρα. Καλημέρα στο, στους φοιτητέ μας, τους διαζώσεις. Καλημέρα και στους απόφοιτους που παρακολουθούν. Ε, έχουμε τη χάρα σήμερα να έχουμε ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον σεμινάριο γύρω από το Interactive Documentary με τον κύριο ε, Αρνάο Καστέλς. Παρόλο που δεν είναι, το Interactive Documentary δεν είναι κάτι που το οποίο το δουλεύουμε άμεσα στο μεταπτυχιακό, αλλά είναι ένα output το οποίο συνδυάζεται και με το παραδοσιακό ντοκιμαντέρ και με τις υπόλοιπε κατευθύνσεις που έχουμε σε αυτό το μεταπτυχιακό, οπότε νομίζω ότι είναι μια καλή προσθήκη και από πλευρά γνώσης και από πλευρά έμπνευση για το τι θέλουμε να κάνουμε ως δημιουργικά όντα αργότερα. Εγώ θέλω να σας πω μόνο δύο πράγματα για το πρόγραμμα που τρέχουμε τα τελευταία δύο χρόνια. Το πρόγραμμα της Περιφερειακής Αριστείας, το οποίο συμμετέχει το Εργαστήριο Εικόνας και Πολιτιστικής Αναπαράστασης με, το, με τη δημιουργία μιας υποδομής, μιας ερευνητικής υποδομής, η οποία λέγεται Aegean Media Production Center. Στόχος μας είναι λοιπόν να ασχοληθούμε με την ψηφιοποίηση αρχείων, την τεκμηρίωσή τους και την ανάδειξή τους. Η ψηφιοποίηση είναι μια καθαρά τεχνική διαδικασία, οπότε από εκεί έχουμε ξεκινήσει, έχουμε στήσει την υποδομή και τον εξοπλισμό. Η τεκμηρίωση και οι διαδικασίες που απαιτούνται ώστε αυτά τα ψηφιακά πια αντίγραφα να γίνουν τεκμήρια με τα σωστά μεταδεδομένα, ώστε να μπορούν στην τρίτη φάση να μοιραστούν στον κόσμο. Και η τρίτη φάση είναι τι μπορούν να παράξουν από τα αρχεία. Δηλαδή, τι νέο προϊόν πολιτιστικό μπορούμε να παράξουμε από τα αρχεία. Προφανώς, ως άνθρωποι του ντοκιμαντέρ, το εύκολο θα είναι να πούμε θα κάνουμε, θα πάρουμε αρχαιακό υλικό και θα κάνουμε ένα ντοκιμαντέρ. Α, μπορούν όλα αυτά επίσης να συνδυαστούν και με τεχνολογίες όπως οι βάσεις ή τα ψηφιακά αποθετήρια ή μπορεί αυτό το υλικό να χρησιμοποιηθεί για κάποιο άλλο, κάποια άλλη παρουσίαση όπως για παράδειγμα ένα, μια έκθεση μπορεί να στηθεί γύρω από κάποιο αρχείο ψηφιοποιημένο. Αλλά ένα κομμάτι που μας ενδιαφέρει πολύ και θέλαμε να το γνωρίσουμε και ειδικά μέσα από την επαφή με τον κύριο Καστέλης, είναι το κομμάτι του interactive documentary. Πώς μπορούμε δηλαδή να κάνουμε μια μη γραμμική αφήγηση χρησιμοποιώντας αρχαιακό υλικό και προφανώς και κάποιες νέες συνεντεύξεις για να εμπλουτίσουμε και να φτιάξουμε κάτι το οποίο δεν είναι το παραδοσιακό γραμμικό documentary που θα βλέπαμε σε μια αίθουσα κινηματογράφηση στις πλατφόρμες μας, αλλά κάτι καινούργιο και πιθανότητα πιο ενδιαφέρον, πιθανότητα να προσφέρει και κάποιο άλλο είδου γνώση από τη γραμμική αφήγηση. Οπότε δεν θα σας καθυστερήσω παραπάνω. Ε, θα παρακαλούσα τον κύριο Βαλιώτη, ο οποίος επίσης διδάσκει στο μεταπτυχιακό, να έρθει να μας κάνει μια πολύ σύντομη παρουσία του καλεσμένου και να ξεκινήσουμε. Ε, ε, οτιδήποτε ερωτήσεις έχετε, μπορείτε να τις στέλνετε στο πεδίο Q&A και θα δούμε μόλις βρούμε ένα σλότ διαθέσιμο, να τις μεταφέρουμε στο κύριο Καστέλς. Uh, and now, I'm just telling the guys from the uh, internet that uh, we have also a Q&A session active. So, whenever you feel before the break, we can check the questions and you can answer them. Okay. Uh, Costa. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Νομίζω ότι από τώρα ξεκινάμε στα αγγλικά. So we can start speaking in English. I'm going to say a very few words about our guest and a very short, short introduction about the new narrations, the new ways of narration actually in documentary and not only in documentary, but we are going to focus on that mainly today. Um, there was always a discussion about uh, concerning these uh, new ways of telling stories, capturing the reality around us, uh, the everyday life. Uh, what we're trying to do with uh, 
whoever from us dealing with documentary, producing documentary or filming or creating, um, being around documentaries. And interactive uh, documentary is part of this world, these, of these new ways of non-linear um, production, of non-linear um, uh, stories, uh, production and films that combine photography, text, video animation, infographics, and maybe other forms uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the years that are coming in the near future. And um, this is not only happening in film studies. Uh, one example is we can take from social sciences and from uh, social anthropology, which, um, and not only social anthropology, social science in general. Uh, we were talking for many years about using audiovisual uh, uh, means in, uh, in our research and uh, a, a, a field that maybe you know uh, called visual anthropology, visual sociology, um, and uh, visual culture. Now we are talking about a new term, a new uh, title uh, of multi multimodal ethnography, trying to combine, trying to capturing actually to to see how we can call the field that we're trying to com in combine the research other forms of uh, uh, telling our uh, art, uh, write the article or are creating an article or other forms of uh, communicating something and knowledge or or a film um, so this discussion about multimodality is something uh, new uh, but something that is ongoing so we don't know exactly how it's going to turn uh, out uh, for many people interactive documentary is still considered something new um, but the first works have been appeared around us like 20 years ago uh, or maybe more. But the last decade, I think we see the impact not only on documentary, but in all forms of narration. Um, take an example in journalism, take an example in other um, uh, parts of uh, using audiovisual uh, means and not only audiovisual how they try to create and make the story more appealing and more um, creative in terms of transmitting the knowledge or the, the content of what they are doing. Uh, today, so I'm not going to tire you more. Uh, we are happy and honored to have uh, with us Dr. Anna Zifrel Castell. I don't know how, um, uh, if you use all the, <laughs> the names all the time. Uh, here in our Department uh, of Cultural Technology and Communication uh, to hear and discuss about interactive documentary and its uh, today's impact. Um, Dr. Arnaud Gifero uh, is a media scholar, curator and producer based in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, he currently serves as a professor at the Faculty of Communication Sciences of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He holds a PhD in communication from Pompeo Fabra University and has been a research associate at the Open University Lab uh, on MIT, and also uh, in uh, IDOCS, a part of IDOCS group of uh, University of West uh, of England. His uh, research uh, interests include interactive and transmedia non-fiction storytelling, documentary film, uh, and digital, di digital culture, I'm sorry. He has also produced several interactive documentaries and has served uh, his field from the position of producer project manager and coordinator, uh, script creator, as well as an academic supervisor. So we're very happy and the, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So first of all, Angeliki, Alexandros and Costa and all students. And a master's degree at the University of the Asian. I don't know if this is uh, well pronounced or not. It's it's an honor. Um, I really enjoy giving lectures in on universities on Iceland. So this is an example. No, it, it's a pleasure to come here and to see that you are in this um, amazing environment and landscape. And basically, we have um, two hours, two long hours, and. This is the title of my presentation from interactive documentary to expanded nonfiction. 
but I want to focus on basically on on productions, and maybe here I have this kind of scholar hat, which is from the professor from the University Autonomous of Barcelona, Autonomous of Barcelona, but as well as a producer um, of a streaming platform from the public media system of Colombia in Latin America, which is called RTBC Play. So I want to show, I want to share with you uh, some productions coming from, coming out from these, these institutions. And the idea is that I, I imagine to split this session into two parts, two separate parts. The third part will be more or less around one hour. And during this first hour, I will introduce the interactive documentary and I will explain and argue how I think that interactive documentary is at the point or is an example of what we consider expanded or extended nonfiction, which is the, the term that I think that is really important here today. And after the break and the Q&A, um, we're going to enter to the realm of the projects, which is, I think, the interesting part of that. And I want to show, I want to share with you three projects today. One of them is Cyber Project. Um, it's a production that was born in the context of the academy, of the academy, which is the suggestion is accompanied by the suggestion of it's important or it's possible to produce working or uh, learning in the academia. The second one is Migrimash. It's an interesting project in which the University of the Asian took part in the past as well. It's a web doc in the form of immersive nonfiction production. And the third one is El Cubo. Uh, Historias Tridimensionales, which is the cube, so dimensional stories, which is the, we are in the fourth season of this project. And basically today I want to speak, to talk about the interactive documentary that we gonna launch next Sunday in Colombia, in a book fair that is happening in Bogota, in the capital. So I think that it's a good moment to, to make this opening or this premiere here in, in Greece and here in Europe today. So this is more or less the, the menu. This is more or less the, the structure that we have. And I will start basically um, from this graphic, from this figure, in which you can see that basically um, we can see the early days of the narrative expression forms. And in along throughout the years, we can, or the decades, or even the centuries, we can see that no much or not very much happened in the terms of that they were some points of changing, very turning points, let's say, with, for example, um, when the alphabet was born, for example, in this four circle, for example, or in the six circle, for example, you can see where the book was in Gutenberg, you know, in the 15th century. But our story really starts with the Mona Lisa, maybe, or with the Renaissance, this movement where Leonardo da Vinci and other um, artists started to focus on the light okay as a key concept of their creations on the paintings for example and then this evolved through for example photography photography was the first moment in which we were able as human to capture one image and to create this kind of representation of an image and in the sense we have here um several pioneers in that well uh, in that in that regard and basically, um, we have uh, the first examples of photography. Although these early days of narrative expression forms were important, it's not till here, till the 20th century, that we have the first big moment in our story, which is the birth of cinema. And here we have two basically <coughs> competitors um, between basically the Lumiere brothers with the cinematograph, we can see in the second cycle, and the kinetoscope which was uh, coined by basically the first or the, the most important inventor of the 19th century, um, Thomas Alva Edison. And here we can see as well that have this moon that some of you will recognize that it's very important moment as well in the story of cinema as well, because it's a moment in, in, in 19th century that the first movie picture came with uh, this first trip to the moon, you know, this journey to the moon from the, this Méliès. And it's the first moment in which we can consider that the first cinema movies were basically non-fictional, were documentary, but this is the first point in which some rules in the field appear, 
by this producer, by basically this guy. And then it's the first turning point in this story in which we can go throughout the 20th century, but we get in a point in which documentary was born. And in the end, basically, in the end of the 20th century, um, documentary took new forms, took new ways of, of talking to the audience, and the interactive stuff appeared in the, in the media, calling or uh, saying that new media was born at that point. So at that point, we have a, a merge, we have a combination between traditional documentary, how we tell stories, and interaction, interactive storytelling. And basically, interactive documentary, it's a mixture between these two fields, these two areas. Um, my idea today is like this frame from the first movie from Nanook of the North, from this movie from Robert Flaherty, 1922. It's to go for the hunting or to go for trying to looking for some kind of definition or some kind of ideas that could represent or that we could take um, from interactive documentary. The first idea is that um, in, in Europe, I, th I think that we had uh, some kind of, of blooming of this new format. It's not, an, it's not a genre, it's a format that maybe in Spain were located this blooming in 2012, 2013, and till 2018, 19, it was like a well-established form of production. What happened, for example, in, in Spain or in, in some parts of Europe is that in this kind of countries, especially from the South, there is no fund, basically. There is no one to produce. So in the end, research or practice can advance, but not hand by hand in that way. And that is what I think that happened in, in some way in Spain. I don't know if in Greece it has started. I don't know exactly if maybe it's early days in Greece, but it's a format that, that to me, it's not enough to, it's not enough to describe these new forms of reality that are basically um, today uh, emerging. That's why I think it's, it's important. So today in this first part of the class, what I want to explain first using this scheme is that interactive documentary, basically, there's, it means a lot of things. It could be have different supports and platforms, and it could be done for web, for example. It's called, it's called web doc, web documentary. It could be, for example, broadcast in cinemas. It could be multi-platform, has different platforms of dissemination. In the past, were done by optical supports like CD-ROM or DVD-ROM. It's taking the form of virtual reality today, it could be part of a connected TV strategy, for example, using a second screen. It could be part of a mobile app, or it could be an interactive installation, or it could be more things. So it's kind of a chamale chameleonic or hybrid um, format that you can use for uh, whatever. But if we have to consider that this is part of mainstream, I would say that not. Interactive documentary is not part of the supposed mainstream industry, but in other areas like anthropology, for example, archive could be or could have a very important um, paper to, to roll in that way. Okay, so the first idea is that interactive documentary we can consider like a format, like a family that has different supports or different platforms. Some of them could be that. But the other thing here or the other idea, which is important to know, is that we have Basically, when we tell stories, we have two parts. The first part is narrative, the story I want to tell. And the second one is format, is the technology, basically, the platform that I'm going to use. Okay. So basically, we have two variables, we have two ingredients. But although we are normally very preoccupied or very worried about the kind of format, the kind of support, the kind of platform that we're going to use, the most important thing is that we have to be clear very clear about story because it's first story second story and third story if our story is not working if what we gonna explain the narrative that we want to use the grammatic it's not um, it's not getting to our audience there's nothing to do i mean the other thing the format is like fireworks it won't work okay so the first thing is that interactive documentary it's not about using topics or or all the topics or some topics 
it's the topic is a topic and it doesn't matter if it's interactive or depend it's it doesn't matter the adjective that you put the important thing is the story and then you can use your adjective and your adjective today is not only interactive it's bigger than that it's very bigger than that it could be interactive it could be transmedia it could be immersive and it could be the next thing which is not the next thing but it's the today's thing which is artificial intelligence or generative artificial intelligence so it's not about we are focusing on interactive documentary it's a good point to start in order not to lose very fast in this kind of net that it's really becoming more and more complex to analyze and to research but on the other hand it's a lot of things that have to be included in that maybe formula which the main formula was the audiovisual documentary i do believe that audiovisual documentary is the main format it's the format that is more i wouldn't say useful but it's more working maybe today we say that okay the thing that it's today it's like immersive i really like like the headset i really like to put that but what is more immersive than going to a cinema uh, cinema theater and to stay two hours letting us uh, our from our mobile phones or our distractions and to be concentrated on a movie this is the more immersive thing that is happening today and it's audiovisual what is happening today even it's audiovisual audiovisual uh, audiovisual documentary linear documentary feature documentary has on its back more than 120 years of tradition of experience and the interactive transmedia immersive generative forms has 20 25 15 10 or even less years of development and this is very important why i am telling this because doing this this this, this journey this starting journey the lumiere's brother when they proposed this kind of short films or actualites with one minute length for example they really didn't know what they were doing at that point no they had no idea they had the machine they had the technology they had the cinema celluloid and they had ideas but they didn't have the language and the language is key after the lumieres came for example Méliès, came for example um, the russian people you know the people from a man with the movie cameras several movies that really helped to create a language and that's what is really happening in this field interactive documentary is very a new format it's a uh, although in some countries as a uh, 15 or 20 years of experimentation but we are proving we are testing this form we don't know as costa said very very wisely we don't know where this changing forms of media will take and this is precisely the best quality of that the best thing that we have in our moment which is not a very good moment for humanity you know we are going to the abyss or it seems that we are going to the abyss but in terms of media big experts are saying today experts from industry and from academics that we are suffering or we are experiencing the best or the best the the biggest transformation of screens of the last 2000 years what does it mean is this a crisis which coming from the greek uh, vocabulary is this a crisis what does it mean in greek crisis it means opportunity it means that you have a huge window of opportunity to create new things and that our frequency now is an is in a disruptive um, level what does it mean that we can do mad things strange things weird things like this and people can really maybe start to understand what does it mean and how to convey these new forms with old forms because it's a moment of a struggle it's a moment of fight between old forms of media and new forms and there's a lot of people that are not interested in this new in that these new forms evolve because there are a lot of interest etc you know that okay but there's we can give a try a try and we can see this as a part of a whole picture or of the big picture okay so basically what i propose here is to find uh, key elements that could 
um, describe what is interactive documentary, basically, and divide these elements between four big blocks, could be more, but basically interactive documentary could serve or could use transmedia narrative in order to spread the work of the project to several platforms. So imagine that there's have a central piece and then you can just um, diversify to other platforms. It can help interactive documentary because we are talking about reality and reality is not boring, but it's conceived as boring sometimes that use gamification or ludification, but is using the structures of the game inside non-fiction in order to make more appealing or more attractive. I don't consider that as a truth, but it's, it's possible to combine these two, two fields. This is, these are another two important words, engagement, which is very important for the user, for the people that will try to experience this interactive documentary, immersion as well. And another word that is coming from the informatics field, from the interface field, which is very important, which is basically the interface itself, user experience, or basically um, how we're gonna design the path in which the user will be inside and usability, how we're gonna test, how we're gonna prove that this interface is working or is not working, okay? So it's a new, it's not a new language, it's a new grammatic and it's a new vocabulary. And normally it's not only that we are, have been, um, let's say not invaded by, let's say we have been inside the audiovisual industry and the audiovisual logics for more than 100 years. So our brain works in a logic, let's say horizontal phase. But let's imagine that we can think in another way, in more, let's say, rhizomatic way, in more, let's say, creation, creating constellations. That's why interactive documentary as an object of a study could be very interesting and very important in that way. Um, in this journey of today, I will propose to see um, the features of interactive documentary um, in a little journey that I prepared of 10 projects. Most of them are mm, not available today because they are done with a technology which is obsolete, which is flash, as you know, um, for interest, blah, blah, blah. The industry is creating some kind of, of emulators of Flash. Let's see if this is going to work eventually or not. But these are my 10 projects. It's like from 10 to 1, in which I think that you could make a, a rough idea of what is interactive documentary. Um, basically, here we have two basic or two top actors in the world. Um, one is in Canada, uh, the National Film Board of Canada. And the other one is in France, is Arte. Okay, so we're going to take examples from these two big giants, um, but let's take a look, let's take a deeper look into these countries. Why these countries has, have so big budgets to do that? And for example, Greece or Spain or in Colombia, we don't have these budgets. Why do you think that? Because maybe in, this, in these countries, in, 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 in France or in Canada, they really care about social uh, populations, social people, social politics, and they really mm, take money from, from, from taxes, from whatever, and put into culture, into arts, and into social development. And part of that is producing these projects, okay? Let's say that at the point of interactive documentary was at the highest point, um, the, the investment in Canada were more or less, I think that $30 million per year, in non-fiction, in production, uh, including video games, etc. Of course, not only interactive documentary. And let's say um, 20, 30 million dollars in France as well. You can calculate in Greece, more or less, each year, I don't know, which is how many money is, is really uh, put in this, in this regard. In Spain, is for, for non-fiction, is, is a very low budget. Let's say half a million, maybe, or, or 2,000 hundred euros per year to create nonfiction. Video games for me are an industry that is coming apart. In, that, in this first project in Prison Valley, we have basically um, the first maybe web doc that really worked in 2010 from David Dufresne and Philippe Brawl. It's a project about the prison system in, in the States, in the United States. And we can go, um, although we can not see the whole webs, of, of these projects and for a reason of time, 
and go uh, directly to the videos or to the summaries or to the trailers of the project. Let's see an image of this of this project and let's see the, the trailers and you can get an idea of the big picture of them. And this is the first one. Um, this is a very long trailer of the project. So maybe we can just the end, but let's uh, try. States incarcerates one out of hundred of its citizens. That's more percentage-wise than even China incarcerates. That's mass incarceration. Literally in the African American and Latino community, every family is impacted. The administrative maximum is all built on sensory deprivation. The prison system has always been part of the culture in Canyon City. And so it, the city basically grew up around the prison there. I know that we are in a county with many prisons, and it gives maybe a sense that there's a lot of bad people in a small space, but we don't feel it. You don't find real friends in big cities. The small town, you you find real friends. It's also important to know that when a recession hits, like we have seen hit uh, America and Colorado, that when you have an industry like prisons, those jobs are not going to be involved in layoffs. You're not going to be turning loose inmates during a recession. Private prisons are an extension of the, the capitalist dream, which is to exploit everything, to exploit labor, just like the war machine is an, an example of that. Every building that you see in Canyon City downtown uh, and in our county that has that kind of block, an inmate uh, at some point cut that block. If the prison was not here, there would be nothing and nobody because they have nothing else to offer. The nickname for this area is Prison Valley. So here is the story, till here is the story. And here we start with the format, okay? With the platform. You can see now just uh, the things that you have to do. You get to a inn, to a hostel. You have to register if you want. It's better in order to explore the area. You are in a room preparing the documentation, for example. It's this format of the documentary game. So you have to pass tests, etc., to see characters interview with them, share with other users at real time. They create some chats at that point, which is very interesting because connect people. And of course, discussion forums. So this was in 2010, maybe the first attempt with a big budget. Let's say this project has a budget of, let's say, I think a quarter, quarter million. And in this case, we have Upian, which is a production um, company in, in France, Multimedia Studio, and Arte. This, this partnership will be very richful in the sense of interactive documentary during this year. But here, of course, people started to say that maybe the story is very powerful. There's, I think, a lot of inmates in the States. There's a problem of the inmates in the States. But on the other hand, um, the platform maybe was very difficult for the users, okay? Because sometimes, uh, digital native could understand the system, could play with the system, okay? But people, let's say, more, mm, more traditional in that way could, could become lost very fast, okay, in the system. So it was a very powerful project, the first one, Prison Valley. They were a lot around this time. And then the second one is Clouds Over Cuba. Clouds Over Cuba, it's, it's an, um, the GFK library, Kennedy Library in, in the States. And it's a very interesting project that talks us about um, the crisis of the of the of the rockets that were in Cuba 
in the in the in the Cold War in Cuba there were some rockets that were pointing to the states at that point um, the hypothesis of the project is that we were um, closest that we thought of a third world war okay at that point it was we were really near in a, of a third world war at that point um, maybe today we are near than 60 years ago but this is the hypothesis of the project it's a very interesting project it's a very serious project very different project and it's about trying to recreate these moments and it it recreates of, in different ways it synchronizes several assets several content and it's very interesting how they deal with this maybe periodistic content okay let's take a look to the summary to the walkthrough you can make a better idea of the project itself <laughs> projects were done in flash so they are not accessible today that's why then there are all our members big flash я выпустил этот военный комплект прямо на новый орлинс everybody we knew was gone to remind us just how close we really came to nuclear war the jfk presidential library created clouds over cuba the interactive documentary commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis follows the developments that led to the crisis, beginning with the 1959 Cuban Revolution led by Fidel Castro, and continuing on until the missiles were removed in October 1962. Along the way, the user is invited to explore 15 related events in greater depth via expert interviews including Sheldon M. Stern, former historian at the JFK Library. I can remember saying, wow, these tapes this is going to just blow the roof off so many assumptions. And Sergei Khrushchev, son of Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. The show Americans, if you will attack Cuba, it will be nuclear war. Topics such as the fear of communism, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and the secret XCOM recordings are all explored in detail from multiple perspectives. As the documentary unfolds, nearly 200 archival photos, videos, documents, and audio recordings are automatically added to a digital dossier for further review at any time. HTML5 JavaScript and WebSocket technology enable a cross-platform experience between desktop and mobile. Users can link to their desktop so their mobile dossiers sync with the documentary playback. Visitors who wanted to follow the crisis live exactly 50 years later could import all the secret XCOM meetings recorded by Kennedy letters between JFK and Khrushchev, and other material into their iCal and Google calendars with one click, enabling them to attend the meetings and receive the communications live over the 13 days. What is going on in Cuba? That is what has got to stop. The film ultimately builds to an alternate 2012, in which the crisis escalated into nuclear war. This short film tells the intertwining story of four fictional characters who each remember the horrors of the war in their own way. Since launch, thousands of visitors from over 154 countries have visited the site, and the world was once again reminded what would have happened had diplomacy not won out. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. I think that this moment, it's, it's, it could be similar in that way. Okay, of this project and it's very interesting in terms of archiving okay this project could be a model and you could take if I know in this project in this university is interested in creating some kind of archive so this this kind of a strategy of synchronizing of, of returning to that point could help in that way and it was a very interesting project um, in the case of beer 71 um, which is number eight in my countdown it's very interesting is this project maybe I can I can just I think give you a try because this is already or online. We have 71 VF. Let's take a look if we can find a moment. Um, because this project was created originally um, without VR and then was reconverted to VR, which is a good strategy behind. Here we can see online the project in VR. And here the story is about uh, a beer. We are humanizing a beer, giving a, a name, uh, our name, a number. Beer, and we are like crossing a, a park in Canada, 
And we can see that there are different actors, assets in the park, which are different animals, different actors. And um, you can see how this starts. No? This is a 20 minutes interactive documentary, which is false because you can stay days like a video game playing. Um, and this is the introduction to the project, you know, with a very immersive music. <clears throat> it's a high budget project as well from the National Film Board, Canada. And uh, the good thing here, the good news is that this project was able to be reconverted to VR. And this is VR, basically. The, the tricky thing here is like the story is very clear. It's like the, the life of a beer um, and the problems that the beer experiments in that, in that park in Canada. And you can see here the, the trailer and you can go through the through that. And here we can experience the this kind of grid, which is a matrix, a matrix, and it's really very difficult to really represent. And this was done in, in Flash originally. Banff National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Narrator. Bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on Earth. You can activate cameras. That explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing God. There are 15 remote sensing cameras in my home range, plus infrared counters and barbed wire snags to collect my hair. I call it the grid. I live around a town called Canmore, in the Bow River Valley. Now Canmore has doubled in size over the past decade and it Real gets time. five million tourists a year. It's not like I can tiptoe around it at all. I need 500 square kilometers just to find enough food to raise my cups. Think of us as refugees, I guess. There used to be grizzlies all across the Canadian prairies and now there aren't any, not one. We've been pushed into the mountains. Thing is, you can take the grizzly out of the prairie, but you can't take the prairie out of the grizzly. If you take us by surprise, we don't look for a tree to climb. We take you can see one of the main problems of this project is like uh, the main, the free exploration, right? When, when you give the user free exploration, the problem is that it's like a mosaic of possibilities. And normally, although we are talking about interactive, transmedia, blah, 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 it's always the same. You always have to offer a path for the user. You have to always accompany the user during, during throughout the, the journey, okay? It's very important, that premise. It's very important because in the end, the user doesn't know what to do in that system. The system, the grid, was critiqued because it was were very complicated to understand. That's why, that's why they, they put a narrator there, which is very, very interesting. But was a very interesting example from Jerry Mendes, Jeremy Mendes from the National Film Board. Then we have Welcome to Pine Point, number seven which is another good exploration. It's working as well. Welcome to Pain Point. We can just take a look as well if you want. I prefer to see the video, but we have time. So as we have time, we can just take a look. If it's online, it's better. I think it's online, but I know that. I don't know if it's working, the Flash component or not, but they transformate as well some Flash components. And this is the, this is the story of a project that doesn't exist, a project, sorry, a place that doesn't exist anymore. It's a place, a mine place in the States. And then when, this, when, the, when the mine place was, was working, the place was really beautiful, you will see, and then suddenly the place disappeared. And then it's about the memory of the place, okay? It's about the, the directors, the authors came back to Pine Point, the place where they grew, grew up, and then they create some kind of a, a memory project. It's very, very interesting, the proposal and the mixture. You talk about multimedia assets, how we combine Mouse basically videos, audios, text, narrator. This is a perfect example Five, of, seven, of, of multimedia combination using click. animation. Mouse click. The structure of, of a book. There is a, a, a menu here, but basically it's linear, in, in a sense it's linear, it's tap by tap. And here is one of the directors talking in first person. He was nine, he went with parents, uh, sorry, his parents when he was young. Then it's like a road movie, a road interactive. 
not only text and video, it's combining as well photograph, albums, etc. It's really a big composition. So you can come back to Pine Point and see the things, see the school, people, all that came. You can create games, composites, colors, etc. You can see here the structures of the of the game as well. The mine closed in 1987. So you became the big deal, big problem. And then there's several chapters. It's another good example of interactive documentary. As, as I said before, interactive documentary can take several forms. The hybrid format, but there's a lot of ways that you can convey content, but the story has to be very clear. It has to be linear in a way. This is another important idea behind, okay? It has to be linear. This is linear because of an order. If don't, probably you will have a problem because the user will get lost a chance. Okay? So it's another good story and hopefully we can see online. Let's say that, it's terribly to say that maybe 80% of the interactive documentary are lost. 80%. And when I say 80%, it's, it's a lost because it's it's a lot it's it's very much because flash just went down in the same line of prison ballet and the same director david dufres with the arte and nfp this is the first the first time that both arte and nfp joined joined forces team up and in 2013 they create format money the the budget was um, I think $1 million, which is a big amount for creating nonfiction, basically, because nonfiction really <laughs> has very low budgets. It's a, it's a pity, but it's, it's like this. And for my money was similar idea to prison ballet, not about the prison system, but about the oil, the oil business in Canada. What we are doing with the oil, there's a, there's a city that is called Fort McMurray. And in the city, you can become rich very fast in terms of working in the industry oil. But on the other hand, what are we doing to the planet, no? In that way, kind of dialogue that we can establish. And the same structure, it's a documentary game. You have some kind of a control panel in which at that time you, that the user even can vote for the selection or for the elections of Cormac Murray. So it was important because the project were really connected to the social indicators of the city, okay? This was, but it was very criticated as well, this project, because some users said that the control panel was very difficult and what is this exactly? Is this a documentary? Is this a game? There's a marriage between documentary and game or are separate things? What do you think? Okay, let's take a look to, to Port McMoney and you can... ...answers from that. The first impression most people have is the long drive north in the middle of the forest for a couple of hours of time and all you see are the trees and you wonder if there's going to be a civilization at the end. But inevitably, when we got into town, it was just better than we could have imagined. C'est, à ma connaissance, une des villes qui a connu la plus forte croissance en Amérique du Nord tout au long des dernières décennies. In short, it is an enterprise of epic proportions, akin to building the pyramids or China's Great Wall, only bigger. Let's go to McMurray, <laughs> the big boom town. The average salary for a family is somewhere around $180,000 a year. Do you want more food? Everybody's living hard, drinking hard, playing hard, spending their money, and God bless them for spending their money. We are so much more than money. We're more than oil sands. We're more than money. We're a community. All across the globe, people are benefiting from what's happening here. They call it development, and we call it destruction. We're proud of the oil sands and what it contributes to the nation and to around the world. We take the environmental concerns very seriously. The oil and gas industry has fostered education, it extends the lifetime, uh, it improves the quality of life. I'd say it's improved democracy. 
vous avez juste un employeur. Que vous l'appelez Total, Syncor, Syncrude, Exxon, c'est un employeur, c'est Oil. Well, the topic is clear. Is This is the interface. Okay, so if we go down, number five, Alma, a tale of violence, Alma, hija de la violencia, in Spanish. Um, this is a very, very impressive project. Here we, uh, the, the authors, which are photographers, Miquel de Plana, Catalan, and Isabel Fouguer, Frances, uh, French, French photographer as well. He pursued this, 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 this woman, Alma, and he had a problem with a, a, a gang in Guatemala, Amara, it's called Amara, it's a gang. So she's, um, she, she has been chased for the last 10, 15 years. So the problem here is that they wanted to do a project with her, but he was, um, she was, her life was really at, in, a, in a very complicated moment. So she had basically, um, she had to left Guatemala. She's hidden in the world somewhere. So this project is not available in South America, for example, because they could, the Maras or the, or the gangs could take some kind of ideas or, or, or uh, of the right place of Alma, okay? Alma is transmedia, has several platforms, a feature documentary, a interview or interactive interview for, for tablets, which was the main interactive projects, uh, photographs, a book, etc. It's a project that has a budget of uh, 5,100 euros. It's not very much, but it was enough in order to pay Alma for putting literally his, her face on the project. Okay, let's take a look of two, two minutes of the app. Tenía 15 años cuando quería integrarme a, a una pandilla. Ellos mismos me ayudaron a levantarme y yo me sentía muy destrozada por los golpes y todo lo que mis sentimientos. La policía eran, era, eran unos desgraciados porque yo como mujer era como, como que ya teniéndome me podían tocar, me podían bañosear, me podía, podían hacer muchas cosas conmigo. Pero claro, yo no, yo no me dejaba. Yo les gritaba, les decía que, que no me tocaran, pero muchas veces que me capturaron me hicieron. Las violaciones, las... Esto ella se volvió particular en, 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 en nuestro barrio porque ellos miraban una mujer bonita, pero esa mujer bonita no se les acercaba pues porque les tenía mucho temor. Entonces... Ellos decían que, pues que la querían para ellos, pero no solo uno, sino que todos. Entonces trataban la manera de, de, de agarrarla para poder violarla. Y en algunos, en, en muchos casos, se dio esto. Casémonos y nos vamos a vivir a otro lado. Yo te ayudo a salir de esto, pero eres una chica muy linda y muy especial y no, y no mereces estar con ellos. Mira, ellos no tienen futuro y tú eres mujer, tú tienes que salir de esto. Y yo le dije, no, sabes qué, vete de mi vida, ya no, no te quiero ver. Bueno, esto es solo un extract. It's, it was about 40 minutes of this interactive interview, interactive documentary. Um, the good thing that they did is that you can, at that point, you can download to the app, to the, to the iPad or whatever, and you can see in local, for example, the project, which was amazing at that time, depending on the places in South America, um, they don't have connection, internet connection. And the other thing here is that 
she's Alma is unable to to walk because she was shot by the mother several times. That's the story. Sorry for the spoiler, but this is like the the secret behind the story. You have to see the the documentary or the interactive part. And basically, as you can see in this kind of countdown, um, the interactivity first was very complicated. Prison Ballet, you know, documentary game. Uh, you have to know a lot of things, control a lot of things, variables, clouds over Cuba, transmedia. Uh, you can uh, submit archives, uh, create VR71, extreme grid. But in Alma, what you can see is that we are running to a more simplistic representation of reality. Because at that point, people that were doing interactive documentary realized that in the end, audience has two main problems. Maybe it gets lost or maybe it um, saturates from a lot of content, okay? So in that case, in terms of user experience or in terms of usability, you have always to avoid these two main problems, okay? How do you can do that? Of course, creating some kind of paths and a narrator that will really can, can give you a, a companion during the, the user experience, during the journey on one hand, and avoiding a lot of stimulus, a lot of content, a lot of multimedia assets at the same time. It's main, in the end, it's one by one. Could be called interactive or transmedia, but it has to be an order. It has to be a, a coherence between parts, okay? Then in number four, we have I Love You, I Love Your Work. This is a guy, it's called Jonathan Hardis. He has a website, it's called JJ27. Um, it's very interesting. This is an artist. He's an artist from the States. And he created I Love Your Work. In I Love Your Work, um, it's better maybe in this case to take a look uh, at the main website because it's interesting to know uh, in that case the, the guy behind. Um, the website is G JJH. And basically he's doing things that normally produce teams of 40, 50 people. And he's doing this, this is a guy, Jonathan, alone, basically. So basically he creates, uh, in terms of visualization, um, journalism, um, a lot of things. But in the case of, of works, for example, if we go to documentary, um, he's very interesting in terms of interactive documentary. Um, the project selected is I Love Your Work. And I Love Your Work, Harris, what, what he really did is to interview, um, well, we can read basically, it's an interactive documentary about the everyday lives of nine individual sex workers. For 10 days, I spent 24 consecutive hours with each of nine different women, okay? While they were filming a lesbian porn series in New York City. Well, the topic is clear. You could, you could um, like or not like the topic, basically. But the thing here is that basically, the project is limited to just 10 viewers per day and tickets, co and tickets cost each dollars each, okay? And there's a long list for accessing this project because the interesting thing of Jonathan Harris is not about only the story, but it's about the format. It's about the context of the story. And we imagine one day, or we consider that website or internet is free and you maybe pay for an app or for a video game, why not paying? for internet. That's why we are so poor in this field, okay? Because everything seems to be um, free. And Jonathan, which is a well-known author said, no, okay, this here, but here the, the, the interesting things of I love your work is the metaphor. The metaphor of these places of the, of the peep shows, for example, when you, see to, when you go to see a woman and men nude, for example, is that you have to pay and only X people could come, could go, and could see through this kind of little, tiny, uh, whatever, holes, no? Because this is the same metaphor. That's what really um, Jonathan uh, started to put here, okay? He worked um, on other projects, which is the same, um, the same idea, for example, network effect. A network effect, for example, which is another example, um, what he creates really is like create this kind of thing that he is photographer and coder as well. So basically the IP of our computer is detecting that we are, or are we living in Greece where the average life expectancy is almost 80 years. So you have 7.99 minutes 
almost eight minutes to access this website and then will be blocked for 20 for 25 hours so it's creating a context then you can choose a topic for example um keys or kick and this is what the website is returning to us all the content at real time in real time sorry of uh, associated to the world to the to the word kick okay it's youtube it's social media all the social media it's at this moment people are loading content regarding the word kick and we can change for example dick cavar no but we only have seven minutes so please stress 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 which is the metaphor of the society that we're living no it's always fast fast consuming fast web fast everything um, it's very interesting the concept you know and the, what we call like the, the nuclear part of the of the content of the story no el nucleo and content which is outside which is very important in terms of multi-platform in terms of interactivity in terms of web design okay so this is the uh, another author in general but in terms of project i chose this project which is the the i love your work okay so this is kind of the frame of the project you have the 10 the 10 lines of the 10 lesbian born girls and then you can access um during 24 hours of the projection that that uh, Jonathan Harris did. Um, the last three projects that I want to show and we'll finish this first part of interactive documentary is Do Not Track. Do Not Track, uh, maybe it was the, the last big interactive documentary or interactive documentary series in 2016. It's very, very long project about, um, there's uh, some entities on, on, the, on the website, it's called trackers. The trackers will follow your path on the internet and then, uh, for example, an ad of this MSc at the University of the Asian will appear on your browser, and you don't know why. That's why the trackers are following secretly your advance, your, your, your route for the website. And here the project is proposing to do the inverse thing. I mean, let's track the trackers. Let's see who is seeing us on the web. Okay, so they propose short chapters, little interactivity. It's very linear. Um, helping you to understand how everything is uh, on surveillance in the world. Okay, how everything is like, which is the not the not today not today's world, but maybe in in five ten years, maybe the whole world will work like with standards like facial recognition, like China, etc. We don't know where we what we want to face. So this project is advancing some stuff in that in that way. Let's see the. A summary of one minute Have and you, you can give a, internet a main idea okay of the project it used to feel like a fun magical place. sorry I just Have put you noticed the internet getting creepier it used to feel like a fun magical place but these days something feels off it seems like a few companies are getting rich and the rest of us get tracked and the more things are targeted to us the less equal we become so a group of makers and public media folks got together to explore what is happening. From our mobile phones to social networks, from personalized advertising to big data. Every two weeks, we'll release a new personalized documentary with a different perspective. We want you to understand the value of your privacy. So we're going to ask you to let us track you. During each episode of Do Not Track, you'll be able to use your own data to understand how information about you is used by others. We'll give you more knowledge so you'll have more power. Let's track the trackers together. Here again, we see a, a, a very important team up between UPIAN, the, the multimedia studio in France, Arte, National Film Board, and Bayerisches Rundfunk, which is a German television, okay? Then they, they got one, one million euros to do that it was it's amazing okay i really recommend to see that the other interesting project here is um high rise high rise maybe is the is the biggest transmedia documentary ever did on my vision of the field uh, it's not only interactive but it's transmedia and it talk about uh, landscapes and basically skyscrapers okay we are living in a high rise the this kind of living it's not horizontal anymore it's vertical 
And we're going to explore how is this life in terms of vertical people living in places that they don't know each other, basically. Okay. There are several projects. The main website is not working. I don't know why. We should, we should phone the NFB. But there's a project, especially inside one of the iterations, uh, which is called Short Story of the High Rise, in which here um, they, which is the main city of high rises in the world, you know, it's it's New York, right? Then here the NFB, the National Film Board of Canada, uh, team up with the New York Times. They rescue uh, old footage and all, uh, and they create this amazing project. To watch the film, just lean back and relax. At any time, click down to dig deeper and get the facts. Dig deeper and deeper. Which is not working very, very well now, but has several projects, several chapters, as you can see, mud, concrete, glass, home. And to me, it's keeping the, the, the right or the perfect balance of an uh, interactive documentary in this case. I mean, there's two modes of navigation. There's a linear navigation that goes alone if you don't, if the user is like afraid of, navi of navigate, of interact. So you can see here and short stories, short chapters of eight, 10 minutes. And then at any point I can just roll out the mouse on the screen and then I can go deeper and deeper. Okay. And can, then I can discover content, but only when I'm like, uh, I want, okay. I decide as user, as you can see. Not so very long ago, the image, though the city of New York is very black, as you can see, <laughs> it's not working. Sorry. Sometimes it fails. Let's see if this works. Maybe in, in Chrome or here, it's not working very well. Let's see if we are able to see the project. Or if done, you can. You should imagine them. Let's give a try. Again. There are some components that maybe sometimes uh, they are not working. So I think that bad news that I don't know if we're gonna see that project, maybe another chapter. Was no. If I try with the second chapter. And Only to... You don't need trend spotters to tell you, because it's not hard to see, that our world cities have mainly one way to grow, and that's vertically. For a century, high rises were made of concrete and steel. Now, urban jungles are made of glass, but what do they conceal? By the 1990s, the spirit of public housing had turned into a ghost and the commodified glass condo rose as the new observation post. All over Asia, pop-up cities, megacities, and super cities increase in relevance, while next-gen slum clearance sweeps through the developing world's informal settlements. The overall budget during six years was one million Canadian dollars for this project, 2009-2015. So it was a big amount of money invested. Several projects were out of them, this is one, maybe the most balanced in my view. This has this kind of, of linear thing, then I can interact inside, and then I can see photographs, uh, play games, I can go deep and deep inside, and then the movie is waiting for me. The movie is waiting for me in order to come back here and restart at the point where I left. Old concrete blocks are the target of so I think that this project could have everything, a good script, good image, good montage, um, it's part of a Tiger project who's good, uh, has good interaction as well. It's very balanced in these ways, in terms of narrative, in terms of story, in terms of linear story, and in terms of interactivity, okay? And it's not overwhelming the user when it's um, navigating. So I think that it's a very interesting example that you can um, maybe this weekend or next week when you finish this kind of marathon of, of classes of the master's degree, you can just take a... Maybe I can send you the links, Angelique, if you want, because I send you the links of the main, my main projects, but not these ones. So I can send you the links and you can share with the students if you want, okay? And finally, number one, according to my view, Las Hijack Interactive, okay? Here it's a production company from, from um, Holland, from 
the Netherlands. Femke Walking and Tommy, and Tommy Palota in 2014 made this uh, work, which is amazing to me. Maybe the topic is not my best topic, uh, but um, really the project is very, very interesting. Um, I think that we can see the, the walkthrough better than the project, which is online. It's already working. And you have a, an idea in, in three minutes of the project itself explained by them, which is the interesting thing of the project. Hi, everyone. This is Tommy Pallotta. And Femke Volting. And we're co-directors of Last Hijack. Last Hijack is a new project from Submarine that's both a feature film and an interactive documentary. The project was conceived as a companion storytelling experience from its inception. In this video, we'll focus on the interactive documentary. From the beginning, we wanted to reimagine what a documentary could be, and we're excited to share what we made with you. Building off our last transmedia project, Collapsus, we continue to push the hybrid form of mixing live action, animation, and interactivity. <laughs> The animation is used to visualize memories, dreams, and fears of the main character. One of the things that we enjoy exploring is user experience and interface as a tool for storytelling. What is Last Hijack Interactive delves deeper into the world of modern day Somali piracy. We have taken advantage of the interactive platform to transport the audience into the story in a way that traditional film cannot. The people there at sea are just being used as pawns. What would a 18-year-old child demand a ransom of $3 million? The interactive documentary tells a bigger story about the origins and the economics of piracy. You learn about the conditions that created the environment that led to piracy and the history of the civil war in Somalia and its aftermath. <laughs> The user interface is a timeline where you can experience the origins of piracy from the 90s to the present day. Through interactive data visualizations, you will find out where the piracy money goes, both in the West and in Somalia. The pirates told me that they required 2.5 million US dollars or they would uh, shoot the crew. In the interactive documentary, the viewer can navigate between two perspectives, the POV of an English captain who was hijacked, or through the eyes of a pirate. Well, that's it. We hope that we piqued your curiosity and you'll experience it for yourself at lasthijack.com. So, according to my view, this combines um, the main ingredients of a, of a good project, which are basically a good content of, of documentary, audiovisual documentary, animation, which really helps, nonfiction and documentary, good interaction. You can synchronize or you can go to deeper in several stories at the same time, which are synchronized, which is basically the hijacker, the captain of the ship, the wife of the captain of the ship, the expert in, in, in hijacks at the same time in several moments in life. And you have around, in a circle, you have the data visualization of the journalism, um, um, which is basically statistics of the last years in Somalia and in the world in general, in terms of hijacking or piracy, modern piracy as they describe. I really recommend that you can just take a look to this, this project if you have time and if you want. And I will finish this, this first part of, the, of, this, of this class with a provocation, okay? I will finish with this part of more theoretical stuff, although I really not hate, but I try to avoid a lot of theoretical stuff. I, I prefer to use more projects in order to give you 
um, ideas on how to approach to produce, which is the really good thing here, although we have to respect academy, of course, which is basically understand that interactive documentary is only a, a, a family or a part of a very bigger field, which is basically expanded nonfiction narrative. Okay, just open, broaden your field, your view, and try to think that maybe if we consider that there are basically two macro genres, which are basically fiction and nonfiction, create from nothing or from an argument and represent reality, nonfiction, maybe in the middle is happening something today. Okay, in these disruptive ways, in this moment of change that we are living, whatever we like or not, something experimental in the way of essay, pervasive, hybrid, and disrupting is happening at the borders. And we are here at the borders, at the frontiers. We are on an island, in a frontier, in a place of frontiers as well. And I think that in this path that I just marked with um, red is, in my view, where the most interesting things are happening. Okay, so I really suggest that you start taking a look there in the middle and trying to mix fiction and nonfiction. Maybe in the near future, we won't be able to distinguish between reality and fiction. Okay, and this is not good. This is not good for story, for history, and for humanity. This is not good. But for creativity, we can take some ingredients and we can add to the formula. And maybe we can start thinking that in that point, in this scheme, maybe going fast, we start with an era in which we have an audiovisual model, a first wave of linear language from point A till point B, in which light, photography, and cinema were really important. Then we split between two basic genres or ways of explaining stories, fiction and nonfiction, and their own um, formats and genres, like documentary, journalism, etc. And then in the 90s, it arrived the, the digital revolution and a second wave emerged, you know, linear multimedia. Here, the model is not audiovisual. It's not going in a linear way from point A till point B. It's like the discourse, the narrative stops and interpels the user, say, okay, you have to do something in order to advance. If done, you stay here forever or you can just quit, okay? This is a very important because sometimes audiovisual and interactive, it's like orals, oranges and apples are very different. And then now, we are getting here in the end, which is the question marks, which is a, a exciting moment in which virtual reality, extended reality and augmented reality, sorry, in artificial intelligence is creating this kind of third wave, which to me is more like character, characterized by a transmedia and immersive production, but we're gonna jump into short, uh, into artificial intelligence, a generative narrative in which we have no idea of what is gonna happen, okay? but interesting things probably will happen. And in this context, we have to understand that it's not enough to talk about interactive documentary. We should talk about nonfiction and maybe nonfiction could be audiovisual, interactive, transmedia and immersive and could be several satellites like documentary, journalism, education, museums, essays, other formats that you could intertwine between together. How is the di dialogue between um, documentary and journalism? It's they need each other? I think so, because documentary could help with narrative structures and journalism could help with data, with veracity, with realism, okay? So the, the tricky thing or the, or the exercise that I propose you before stopping now, um, and we can say Q&A now and talk a little bit, is try to make some kind of mixture Okay, it's not like a match in the terms of Tinder, for example, it's not so funny to make a match like in this con dating app, but it's, it could work, okay? Try to um, select one area in which, for example, in my case, today I'm here working or invited because at one point I decided to go on the research in the terms of documentary and the form of expression was interactive. So I became a researcher in interactive documentary. If you like nonfiction, if you like reality, if you like the stories, you should be specific or you should go deeper in these three of my proposals that you can make a match and maybe then get cool, could help you to, to be clear about what you wanna do when you become older, okay? 
So we're going to stop here. And if there's questions I can, or if don't, we can stop for 15 minutes if you want. Yeah, thank you. And uh, well, we have a question uh, from a old uh, graduate of the department. He's now working in Cyprus teaching. And he's very excited about the stuff uh, that you show us. Show us. And uh, he says, what we used to call an interactive documentary, sorry, would what we used to call an interactive documentary be the predecessor of today's fragmented documented reality through social media, for example, TikTok? Can you repeat the question? Because it's very yeah. long. <laughs> Academics. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. What we uh, would what we used to call an interactive documentary be the predecessor of today's fragmented documented reality through social media? I, I don't think so. I don't think so that maybe there are separate things, but maybe the common thing is that we use reality. I mean, there's a TikTok is reality. Yeah, it's reality, but we can just put layers on that reality, but it's something that is happening depending on the on the person. But I think that social media or TikTok or they're separate topics. And we have to be very careful because there's the, the, the landscape or the ecosystem is so big that it has to be very, we have to thought about more deeply about that. But I would say that I don't think that is the same thing. Interactive documentary is one thing. And interactive documentary, maybe the problem that has is that it's so complicated to produce. It's so, it's so, has so different parts and TikTok it's so easy or social media is so easy to produce that it's very different. This is a very complicated format and very, very expensive format and requires so, requires so many um, profiles, very specific, specialized, specialized profiles, while social media has another way of production and another logics of, of, of consuming. And so I think it's, it's separate, it's different. Okay, you wanna anybody from the class? Let's place like... for the real. Hey, for the real, to... for the real ones. <laughs> to the to the but in, in Spanish, I in Spanish, in English, please, because I don't understand Greek. I'm sorry, I tried, but I understand Paracalo and Ejaristo Ine. <laughs> sorry for my ignorance, but it's quite complicated Greek. First of all, thank you so much uh, for opening our eyes and our minds to a lot of new things, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I think I appreciate it also that you showed us a lot of practical examples. I think uh, there are a lot of issues to discuss as you also opened up the discussion at the end, which are very big, which I won't go into. But I just want to make also a little bit of a provocative comment myself. Uh, it seemed to me by watching everything that you've showed us that, I mean, I wonder whether interactive documentary is really the right term. Is it not more documentary games? It, one of them was actually called a documentary game. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that the, this approach has a lot to offer to the gaming world where in terms of educational and other content, given what the gaming world is today and, and how much money goes into the business. So my question is, in the last 10 years where a lot of these extremely interesting examples that you showed us have happened, has there been any impact in the gaming uh, industry and gaming design, because this is really what all this, in my mind, should fit into. As, as far as I can see, it, probably this approach has a lot more to offer to the gaming side rather than the documentary making side, but because everything is open. But I just wanted to know your it's view on this. It's a good question. Um, I, uh, to me, I'm more interested in, in nonfiction. I'm an addict to nonfiction. So it has been it has been a big discussion there. It's not about maybe not so focused on documentary games, but it calling new media documentary or interactive documentary or transmedia documentary or new formats documentary. But the game was not there. But I really agree that that game, games or, or gamification, ludification, give a new dimension to the documentary. But, but sometimes when we need games like For McMoney or Prison Valley, is that something is missing in the documentary itself. Because sometimes it seems to the documentary producers that we are forcing, forcing the genre, forcing the format in order to become another thing. And that was 
David Dufresne, que es mi friend, por ejemplo, was very, I was very critical with him, and the industry was critical even because we, sometimes in, in documentary games like For McMoney, people doesn't know if, if there was a documentary or there was a, a video game or a game. And I think that maybe we are, it's an hybrid thing. We are there in the middle of something, but documentary game has not evolved. I mean, interactive documentary has been stopped for several factors. But on the other hand, documentary game, which could be a subfamily of interactive documentary or not, has not evolved uh, ever. And, and, and games, video games, there are some games that are narrative, more documentary, but games are, or video games are based on fiction. So this kind of, of way that you are suggesting that documentary could be a documentary game and become a format or a, or a genre has not evolved either. So there's a lot of confusion in the field in the way that we expect that maybe this field uh, grew up more in the past. And for several factors, and especially in, in, in Netherlands, in England, in France, in Canada, they stop. They stop to do interactive documentary. So my question is not about documentary game, basically, but, but why the industry decided to stop and doing other things, other stuff, okay? So I think that maybe that I, I, I answer you with another question, no? Not about documentary game, but I'm not so interested in the, in the games it's, uh, themselves, but in the, I'm interested in the, in the strategies that the games offer and not only to documentary, I give you another provo provocation, but to nonfiction. So my, my, my work now in, in this kind of post-doctoral um, studies that I'm doing now is trying to offer to the industry some guides of production for nonfiction projects. So I'm very like stubborn and in that way, I'm trying to, do, to work on that, on that field. Okay. I will try to answer short, okay? Because we don't have a lot of, my answers will be short because um, sorry not to explain a lot, but we don't have a lot of time and we have three amazing projects that I want to share with you. And at, uh, in one hour we have to be out. <laughs> so sorry, but the time is the time. So I'm just uh, gonna comment on um, a very, very interesting question and a very interesting reply. Um, with, I think the, the last project you show us, last uh, hijack, I think they mentioned uh, Collapsus. Collapsus is a, a persuasive game um, that tries to persuade players to be more environmental friendly, I think. They mentioned collapses, but I'm not sure. But I teach See. my my students about this uh, particular project. So maybe persuasive games is somewhere in the area between See. interactive documentaries and uh, what we would call, you know, the the video game industry into the non-fiction area. So this is Agreed. my comment. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank this you. Kind of news games, persuasive games. Could, could fit into what you are suggesting that that games should be implemented in order to be, to, to to make nonfiction or documentary more attractive but depending on the person because for me I mean I don't I don't like fiction I mean I see fiction I watch I'm, I, I see streaming platforms but I'm I'm very um, focused on production nonfiction I don't know why depending on the person no majority of person or a lot of persons like to produce fiction and it's Respectable in that way, no? but it is quite. More questions? Well, first of all, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank you myself for your presentation. As a matter of fact, after Flash has collapsed, it's very difficult to find interactive documentaries wandering in the huge world of internet and it was a fine opportunity to uh, contact the collection and finally chosen ones. So uh, my uh, almost philosophical question is uh, the term interactivity, uh, as far as I could cut, got it from the examples we have shown us, uh, isn't appears in these documentaries in terms of uh, navigation or in terms of uh, uh, selection of the depth of information, um, 
or in terms of launching content. But what about interactivity in terms of the user being able to add something, to change something, not only in his own uh, way of viewing the content you have prepared, but something that can be left for other users or other viewers to experience afterwards. Because uh, since I'm working in another field of uh, non-fiction narratives, and I'm very happy that you have mentioned it, uh, exhibition and museums, there uh, it's a big question whether we can allow visitors to interact, not only to launch content, but also to alterate or to change what we have as creators prepared. Um, what you suggest is what I consider as generative um, interactivity, or there's several authors that really um, separate interactivity. The, 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 the easiest way to understand interactivity is, uh, is low interactivity, medium interactivity, and high interactivity, or strong interactivity. And in that way, I think that the, the, there's, a, there's a triangle, a pyramid, and this triangle, normally, the, the, the studies or research says that 90% of the users doesn't make anything, basically. 9% make something, which is a blow, take decisions, and one only percent, which is growing, contributes to the, to the work in yeah. terms of... Uh, but the system has to be prepared in order yes, but to accept. My problem is that sometimes we're uh, talking about interactivity, uh, and uh, we're very satisfied with our products, although we do not actually offer something uh, to the final user. For instance, I used to say to my students that when you want to go to the toilet, you uh, handle the doorknob and you open the door, but you never think that you have an interactive toilet. It's just a, a physical uh, it's action. Another, it's another, another if class. you want to enter the room, Design you have to enter the toilet. door. So yeah, I understand. If and you just push a button in order but, to launch but, content, then and is it really this, something this, interactive? This light, I dislike this. This last answer, um, I think that has the key. What you are trying. I mean, we are designing interactive systems for the last, for interactivity or for narrative for the last 20, 25 years. The language has not evolved. It's what I said at, at first of class. It's not the language, the audiovisual language that you have, which is running and it's working the star system in Hollywood, etc. That interactive language, which is not so mainstream for everyone. There's, and, and, and interactivity as well normally needs that the user or the person who is in front of the interface thinks, think, and take decisions. And by story, we are humans and we are lazy. And this is not, I'm not saying that. I mean, it's a study that we are, we want to stay near the firebone and there. And so in the end, sometimes interactivity, it's not so easy to deal with the, with the user. So this could be another reason in which we, we sum up these two parts. The, the interactive systems are not well designed, has errors, has problems. And on the other hand, um, we are just knowing or developing a new language, which need more years and more people that understand these new languages, for example. That's why, for example, streaming, streaming platforms are not betting, for example, for interactive content. O although Netflix has 25 or 30 interactive projects, most of them for children, they are not betting a lot of money or a lot of research. They are producing like yes or no. No, it was this kind of snatch, which was the first one, was amazing. It, it seemed to be well. But then you go to Disney, for example, you go to HBO, and there's no, nothing interactive. And that's that, that's that's a warning. I mean, because something is not in that way. Yeah, in the way of of narrative and TV and broadcasting. There's other ways. There's other fields in which they're working. But but I think that probably um, we have to. We need more years in order to be more interactive. But the problem is that a new word has come into the equation, and this word is immersive today, and it's um, inter artificial intelligence, which is interactive as well but it's, it's coming to this field. And this is the problem that I really observed in interactive documentary. When the moment of interactive documentary was in 2018, then Facebook in 2015 just got, just put 10,000 millions for developing immersive and the headsets. 
and then the immersive really um, put more like the, the interactive more obsolete or more like a term that was in a second term and then all the budgets all the all the resources went to the to the immersive no so it's kind of it's like on kind of high and 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 it's quite complicated to understand it's a, it's a complicated field okay uh, i hello first of all thank you very much for the presentation it was uh, very interesting uh, i just wanted to say something similar as the question before uh, how do you see the future in the uh, interactive documentaries and how can we evolve the participation of the user um, and uh, at the beginning of your presentation in the first project in the prison valley um, I think you said that uh, the user could discuss with the characters is, is that right uh, so the question is how did that happen and if we can use something like that for the future to make it even more participatory yeah prison valley was an, an example that I quote because they did that they they create some kind of applications using chats in real time with characters from the prison valley and with directors with David Dufresne and, and the other guy so it, it, it really worked because people really empathize and really identify with the main directors they talk about the problems that they were there for six months so they were part of the documentary um, landscape let's say that way so it worked for prison valley but the example was not replicated in other document in other interactive documentary um what i think is that basically um, at that point uh we thought that maybe interactive documentary was going to replace the feature documentary and 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 we saw as a competition between forms of documentary uh, between new avenues in documentary and i think it's not about competition it's about um it's about taking part together in the field no so in the end a lot of people started to say interactive documentary doesn't exist it's not a good format it really kills feature documentary because you know there's a lot of people that is more like traditional and it's respect in that way so what i see is that um interactive documentary um it won't work for the mainstream i mean for example netflix etc won't gonna produce interactive documentary in the etc but in some fields especially in education especially in museums especially in anthropology especially in in, in other in archive it, it really works it really worked for a specific purposes and i produce interactive documentary in several experiences in the past and i can prove this statement but what we expect that interactive documentary gonna replace the traditional documentary etc no the audiovisual documentary is still like the main and it's in a very good moment of 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 health really people is going are going to the to the cinema theaters it's, it's watching more than ever documentaries true crime for example documentaries etc on the streaming platform so it's a very good moment for for non-fiction and for documentary but interactivity has a lot of problems so basically what we are asking me but now it was not the topic of the day but you are interested in in this I see four major problems in interactivity in general, but specifically in nonfiction, I see the role of the author. I mean, the director, for example, uh, has to control everything or not. Um, it's not the same to explain one story in a linear way in which in the end you have a conclusion that explaining eight stories in the same way and that you cannot control in which of the eight endings will finish the user and what idea in the end because it could be eight ideas but maybe for the author this is not working or it could be stressful from the view of the author we are opening this view today with the new media but the author has problems with that the other thing is the business model who is paying the party i mean where's the money in non-fiction there's no money and people if you cannot see a revenue then you have a problem an interactive documentary normally there's no revenue it's coming from broadcasters that has a public funding and you are getting people from the tax from the people and you're you investing but you have no return so in the end it's very difficult to get high budgets to make very good projects well crafted in that way and the other is who's watching the audience i mean in the end you have a, sh a share in tv you have a, a prime time in tv you have in, in platforms but one side which is not good displayed which is not working very well a bad distribution 
we are premiering, but no one is there. Who is watching that? If you have no figures in, in, in audience, you have another problem. And the fourth problem, the other author, business model, and audience is, is preservation. I don't know if it is good in English, this word. See? It's digital preservation. What happens if flash or a component falls and the 80% of the productions are not available anymore? Yeah. So these four, these four problems, to me, are, are, are structural in interactivity in general. And are problems that have to be faced. And video games have resolved some of them. The author has very clear that this, this kind of a story, there's big business models like cinema, the audience is clear, there are gamers, there are a community behind, and the preservation is between uh, platforms, the Steam, etc. In video games, it's working, but it's not the same. These kind of budgets that you manage in video games that in nonfiction. In nonfiction, we have a problem, but we have time and we are able to, to, be, to be able to, to, but this, to me, these four problems are major in, in productions, and especially when interactivity comes, comes there. Oh, it's almost time. Okay, yeah, I so think why, we're going to have a small so many break. questions. I, I, I thought that no one would question it. A small break and then okay. we'll continue. There's all, only one okay. last question. I will try. I, maybe I, I will focus on, on two projects, besides maybe then three, because okay. we don't have time. I will focus on two projects and the last part of the class, okay? One last question was about the distribution. So I guess distribution is internet. Right. I mean, there's no other means of distributing and no distribution. Distribution is a problem as well, because there are no, there are no basically festivals that promote this kind of. There are some several parts of of tal, and there are no prices. There are no. It, it's quite complicated. I mean, you produce one of these projects, and then what? No. And then, for example, in cinema, you can hire a distribution company that can move your work. Uh, throughout festivals, whatever, but interactive has not developed yet a big structure in terms of, of festivals, in terms of recognition, in terms of whatever. So it's, uh, it's complicated. Can, can I add only one, sure. one thing that, um, that uh, actually proves your, your answer, that there, there are some festivals that have selected some interactive documentaries, part of the competition section or student section, etc. But there are so few that uh, proves uh, there's exception to to the to the practice to the common practice. So it's for, true that. For example, I was in Barcelona. For example, I I worked during six years for Docs Barcelona, which is a festival documentary in Spain, and I ran the interactive section, which which was called Interdocs Barcelona. So we had a lot of things there during six years, but in 2018 we had we we didn't had audience enough audience. Let's say we at the, at the first we did a conference we had 500 people. There, in the end, we have 25 persons or 30 persons to our conference. So in Docs Barcelona, they decided to cut, to quit with a section of interactivity. And they decided to quit to show interactive or new media documentaries. No, they are more focused on VR or whatever. So I agree. If there is no industry, so in the end, it's a mixture between market, industry, and in the end, you have a culture. But you need basically before market and industry. And you sum up market and industry, and then you develop like video games, a culture of video games. In nonfiction and interactive documentary, this didn't did not happen. So it's problematic. But this does not mean that you cannot try or you cannot be interested in this format, which is existing and, and it's really uh, working for some some areas, right? Okay. Okay. So Stop. the question is how many minutes? How, how many minutes? Really? Depending on you, what you what you rest. Uh, 10, 15 minutes, yeah? 10? 10, 10. 10, okay, so we'll be back in 10. Okay. Sumérgete en la experiencia.
No, pero, pero ya puede decirse como...
Ok, so, last round, um, let's make 40 minutes and we finish, ok? 40 minutes more or less um, and we finish. I can try to do in 30 minutes, but I can go faster with my English, which could be a disaster. So help me in that way, a little of, bit of patience, please. Um, great. So um, what we were asking me before, I, as far as I understood, is that um, when I was um, research affiliate um, at MIT, Open Documentary Lab, I was research affiliate for five years. And in the end of my time there, we were answer, we were questioning um, what happened sometimes if the technology failed and afterwards flash failed. And then after I just, um, I, when I was out, after I went out from the MIT Open Documentary Lab, they started this project, which is called the DocuBase. The DocuBase has, um, 423 projects of uh, called um, expanded documentary. Okay, it's basically interactive documentary, but here you can find more than um, 400 projects. And each project, for for example, Voliad playing with reality. I don't know this project. For example, it's a virtual reality animated documentary experience. You have here the year comment comments from the producers. It's like a technical, um, it's like archaeology of documentary, but it's the place. To me, it's a place where you can discover and you can um, um, you can access to a wide variety of, of documentaries. Some of them are online, the other are not, or are physical or are installations of this family, which is interactive documentary, okay? So this is a, a, a directory, a place, which is very interesting to stay and, and MIT Open Documentary Lab um, is, is the place, is the place. Um, I wish I could be there, but you know, life is, <laughs> is happening and sometimes you could be there and sometimes you are out. But it was a pleasure for me to stay there for five years and I learned a lot from, from basically Sara Wolosin, director, William Uricchio, the principal investigator and other partners from, the, from this laboratory in Boston. Well, basically, um, let's go for the funny things. Um, I will show you, um, in principle, where three projects, but I just um, reduced to two for, for, for the, the, the short time that we have. And basically, I, I want to, to share with you two different projects in nature. The first one is related to this university. That's why it's interesting. And in a way, I am premiering these two projects today here although Migrimach has been produced um, during 2022, basically. But today, um, well, it's not well known. And recently, we got uh, a prize from the Media Lab, uh, University of Granada. University of Granada, um, we did uh, the, main, the main researcher there in, the, in, in literature, which is uh, in Spain, a catedratic, which is the highest figure in, 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 in Spanish university. Uh, Domingo Sanchez Mesa, Dr. Domingo Sanchez Mesa, got fund to create um, or to get got fund for a Erasmus Plus project. Erasmus Plus project um, is more or less a research plus development project in which you can do something applied, which is very interesting today in university. But there's uh, mandatory things. He's, Domi he's Domingo, for example, you can see here in this slide. But the mandatory things is that you can have to partner up with other universities. So here, the main, the main partner, University of Granada, team up with uh, University of the Asian, Universidad de Salento in Italy, Arsi, uh, also in Lecce in Italy, Lesbo Solidarity, which I suppose that you know that, so I'm sorry for my ignorance, and Asad, who produced really the, the web doc, the immersive web doc that I want to show today. So we did basically three things uh, during this Erasmus Plus project, the team behind basically in Granada, but in this whole, in these universities, we create a master's degree that we hopefully this year start. It's a master's degree which basically deals, uh, the title is Master's Degree in Communication Studies and Border Cultures, or Master in Professional Training Migrimash, Mediterranean Border Cultures and Communication Studies. 
So we are doing now the, the subjects. We are creating all the structure of this master, which is basically here. All the parts sh should help to improve this 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 knowledge about frontiers, immigration, borders, etc. We create a MOOC. We are creating a, this kind of online online massive course for everyone, and we create the web doc and the school, which is to me the most interesting things. We create this web doc game skateboarder we come back to the game again <laughs> to the format of the game of course a web dog game on the southern border um, from three specific places basically the south of spain south of italy and uh, the Aegean sea and this part of the wall between turkey greece etc okay so here we you have all the information we create didactic guides as well footage festival um for for taking for this kind of uh, migrage that we want to create uh we are accepting practices as well uh well a lot of content that we create and basically today what i want to show you a little bit is besides the school um, there's a project that really um, helped to spread the word of this so we create this project basically the five partners but as well uh, asad we create this project um, using Unity, which is a, a very complicated engine for creating basically video games, but as well for anything that, that could be, everything that could be immersive, etc. And basically, uh, we create this, this web doc from an optical view of, uh, we want to put immersion in that. Um, we had a, a limited resource to do that. And basically, what we wanted to do is in a collaborative way. I mean, we asked to different partners that they, that they basically shoot footage in terms of like Alexandros, for example, and students, and they were in charge of, of doing this, this task. And of course, the footage is, the weight of the footage is, is quite impressive inside, but hopefully you can see the result. If don't, I have a, a video capture, but uh, two hours ago, it worked. So I think that worked. So the, the video game, we did this kind of introductory video. The idea is to seduce the, the user. So I basically- On the count of 10, you will up. be in Europa. I say one. count of ten, you will be in Europa. Be there at ten. I say ten. This is the luxury video of the project. Then I can just skip if, if I want, but then I just um, go directly to the map. Here are all the partners. And then this was our first project, Immersive. So there are three parts, basically. There are uh, settlements, there are refugee camp, and there are a border school. So basically, these three parts are two uh, migration camps and the border school. The border school is the place in which we can go for the resources, basically. Um, it's immersive, so I can move around. And here we connect with the website, with websites, HTML websites, external in order to be able to, to find some, some content, right? We have audiovisual practices, didactic guides, cinema fest, and collectives. Well, audiovisual practices, I go here and I can access, I can go out to the website, and open a new tab, and I can go to the specific place in which I can access to the, uh, sorry, here, for example, I have school training practices and I have several presentations, for example, several content that I can use in 
several fields. Then I have didactic guides, which was another part which is interesting. So we need guides. And I think they are in Spanish, they are in English as well. But there are several guides that I can just access here. And Basically, we have several collectives that are just um, very interested in that kind of, of narratives as well and kind of topics. So we have some kind of brochure of different parts um, in Genially, which is another software which is connected to this one. Genially is a HTML software that allows to make things interactive without code, basically. But um, besides this kind of resources, which uh, Erasmus Plus project uh, must need. We have the stories. We have the narrative behind. Um, for example, um, where do you prefer to go to to Ma Mamadou or with Narges? Mamadou, Narges. Well, ladies first. Let's go with with Narges. We have a description. Twenty years old, lived in Kabul and was interpreted for a foreign news company explain the context when the Taliban affair basically arrived by plane to Istanbul and there began a journey to hell as she describes. He, she has seen the violence in Moria camp in Afghanistan and basically um, here we get this zoom that you're gonna see. We're gonna enter, we're gonna go inside. It needs some time because you know it's immersive. It's, 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 wait the content but hopefully it will work but now reality is very black they we have some kind of animation
It was the night of September the 8th when refugee camp Moria on the Greek island of Lesbos went up in flames. The fire was probably started by people driven by just one wish, to get out. We did a little documentary and basically you can see here we transform reality, we transform documentary into something which is basically immersion now, immersive. Now we can see images, it's a, it's a little documentary um, and now you can see we transform this into something virtual, um, especially working with Assad and then I should um, should go there if it's working, but it's it's it's, it's slow. I don't know why, because it's charging. And I then I should arrive to the to the camp. maybe go to the to the to the other file that I have recorded because it's not working here it's it's the way it's important all right let me let's give me another try why I prefer to show you. It's easy. You go here and look for. I prefer to show you in real time everything, but sometimes, you know, with technology, it's quite difficult. So I prefer to. I will give a last try. On the count of 10. Okay, seems, seems that here we go. So we are approaching the, the, the camp, then the, the journey really starts, in which I will, um, here we transform this idea of documentary, of linear documentary, of audiovisual footage into something um, with the games strategies behind, and then I'm just um, here it was difficult to, to create this kind of 3D environment, to put inside Unity and to make it, um, to create some kind of a game. So we're gonna enter, we're gonna go to the, to the entrance of the facility. And now I'm Vaseli, as you can see. Now I have to start with the uh, finding, you know, especially where, where is this, this, sorry, I just to mark using the button. My, my path and the idea is it's an, only an example but the idea is to go through the little by little step by step that's why I wanted to show you using the video it's better for the presentation and step by step there's a basic needs 
there's some supplies that you have to obtain and it's with patience that you have to go forward and I will do the first now the first part of the I played something here but I don't control exactly the, the rules so here is like so here is like the where I have to go okay so this is the idea and this is a mixture between virtual reality and video okay there's some proofs there's some games there are some steps that you have to accomplish in order to spend one day or one week in the camp, okay? Trying to recreate how is the, the life in the camp, okay? Summing up, project is bigger, but this is the idea. We have to make some arrangements, some improvements to the project because as you can understand, it's very complicated to create this kind of 3D environment to make this immersive, which is another part of the the project but I mean we we spend some resources on that so here is like the what you have to do like the different find out what Moria is find a cram who will tell you what Moria was like in the past you have here a map and basically you have to move around and meet other people and, and etc okay so this is the first step of the project escape Europe normally a research plus development project don't have projects like this but in this case we are like um, working on that and trying to improve the project because it needs a user um, a user test now and to make some changes in the way we navigate and we and we use it but I think that it's a good first approach to the problem here although it's a weight project it's difficult to advance sometimes and that's some things that need to be need to be improved okay great this is one project and i remember it's part of a larger transmedia project it's not only the web doc it's the master's degree and the, the massive online course the mooc that we develop in this in this erasmus plus the project in which the asian university was one of the partners and the other project that i want to share with you today is um this project um, it's has been on air for the last, I think, has been premier, has been, the premiere was in four months ago, I think, and now we presented to a Media Lab prize at the University of Granada, academic prize, and we won this prize from the Media Lab, so, so it's a prize for the whole university and project, and the idea is to improve the project in order to be able to present to another festivals and another, um, another uh, obtain another recognitions. The other project, um, it's another one. Um, I started working when I finished my audiovisual studies in, in Autonomous University in Barcelona 20 years ago. I finished my studies in audiovisual and then I started working for a, for a local TV called 25 Television. I had my idea of creating an educational television of quality and that was not the case, but I learned a lot in that first during three years, from 2000 till 2003, I worked there as technician, as producer, as um, cameraman, etc. All of things, and then I stopped. I, I restarted studying at Pompeu Fabra University, several post degrees and a doctoral doctoral studies. And when I finished in in um, the University of Pompeu Fabra, I started working two years for uh, Catalan Television, which is autonomica autonomical television in, from Catalonia, it's called TV3. I worked two years making the teletons from a marathon. Marathon uh, works with diseases, with um, basically uh, several important diseases. So here, for example, um, you can see uh, an example of that, of that production of that kind. Um, so during those two years, 2013, 2014, I work doing the Teleton of the Marathon. Specifically, we did the, the interactive proposals, the interactive projects for this Teleton. Uh, the first year was neuro, neurogenerative diseases. 
and the second year 2014 was uh, heart diseases so we create simple projects that help people to understand how suffer people from neurodegenerative and heart diseases and then i started a, a interesting um, new uh, stage of my production companies and, and broadcasting services working for spanish tv for radio television española I, I work with them for doing three projects these three projects are basically Bugarak, surviving the apocalypse which is a project about the end of the world according to the maya predictions in 2012 it's like an ironic vision of the life um and you can play because it's a documentary game as well and we did sex sex maracas y chihuahuas as well which is a biopic of a well-known musician in, in catalonia it's called xavier cugat it's a very a very interesting project as well and another project which is called la sin sombrero and la sin sombrero is a project from the spanish generation of 27 there we can remember for example dali or garcia lorca for example big artist but what happened to women no? what happened to women at that university at that at that generation women were basically forgotten like always and that project really tries to um tries to go to the rescue of the memories of these artists of the generation of the 27 in spain um at that point creating or producing bugarak or sex maragas and chihuahuas in, in, in several roles in these transmedia documentaries i had like the i got the experience and in 2020 um, i was living half time in, in spain and in colombia for familiar familiar uh, reasons and then um, the public system in colombia which is called radio television colombiana the colombian radio tv rtbc um, started in 2018 with a streaming platform called rtbc play in rtbc play basically they bet for innovation and in 2020, with the COVID, at that time we were in, in house, the director, Juan Vaquero, told me, asked me to create or to develop this format, which is called the Cubo, the Cubo, Historias Tridimensionales, the Cube, Tridimensional Stories. We did uh, till now three seasons of this project. In the first season, we uh, it's called The Power. So we basically there, it's a, it's a fiction in the form of theater. It's interactive and immersive theater and we basically reflect on the differences um, between power um, with several um, with several um, subjects characters so basically each of el, el cubo the cube each season takes um, brings um, six characters and our idea was to create some kind of this this Iñarrito, do you know uh, Iñarrito, Babel, for example, Amores Perros, these movies that intertwines several life. So this was the idea, but making interactive. So this was the idea, okay? So basically we create these three seasons. Um, the first season is El Poder, The Power. I will show you a video. And in these two minutes, we can make an idea of what we created in this first season, which is fiction. I remember, but it's interesting to see how we merge. It's in English. Ahora es mi culpa. Sí. Que yo no tengo por qué mostrarle mis senos ni antes ni después de la cirugía. Y usted no tiene por qué mandarme este tipo de mensajes. Usted fue la que entró acá a hablarme de sus senos. Like this one, right? Maybe here. Ahora es mi culpa. Sí. Que yo no tengo por qué mostrarle mis senos ni antes ni después de la cirugía. Y usted no tiene por qué mandarme este tipo de mensajes. Usted fue la que entró acá a hablarme de sus senos. ¿Qué? Soy doctor. Vuelo muy bien. Doy esperanzas. Calcificaciones intracraneales. ¿Le dijo eso? ¿Para qué lo hace? Le estoy demostrando. Escribo lo que pasa. ¿Sus personajes siempre vienen de la vida real? Desde que están escritas. ¿Y usted es uno de sus personajes? Tal vez la niña de nueve años que escribió un cuento. 
que su profesora le obligó a romper. Aquí está. Aquí está. Voy, voy, voy a ahorrar. A veces, la belleza no es lo que aparenta. No, 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 Viviana, esto no es ningún chiste. Tienes 15 años y estás embarazada. ¿Algo más fuerte? No quisiera decirle que... ¿Qué? No, esto no está bien. Aquí pueden ver por lo que llamé. Aquí pueden ver a dónde llamaron. Todo lo que está escrito pasó. Y por desgracia para alguien, pasará. So this was the first season here what we it's important in this project that you uh, the register is, is key because using the register we can just um, follow the steps of the user basically and here is like the project no it's the, the power we can just access inside there is a lot of people involved as you can see so in interactivity more than 100 people is like a it's like a big production um, directed by Juan Vaquero which is director my role here is the director of interactivity and design and the script and basically the structure is I will not register now because we have some problems dealing with here. And I have the six, we have this kind of onboarding, which is help in order to do things. And basically, as you can see, we have six characters. For example, Alba has a problem because he wants to fit um, her breasts, for example. So he says um, that she's always... Lo que más admiran y desean de mí. Son her breasts, but Lo que más me people hate son mis senos. her breasts as well. So we can choose, for example, Alba, and then we have three modes, okay? So each mode is one way different. Here we have the chronological time of, of Alba, but for example, in the labyrinthic mode, we have more than 300 connections. It's like, like the subground, like the subway, you have connections between, and then you can go creating your own cube, creating your story, no? So for example, so short videos of three minutes. Este fin de semana no puedo salir de ahí. moment in which the doctor just evaluates in order to, to being able to make the surgery, surgery to the, and there's this kind of moment in which este they tema. are like, it's there like, sí, a eso me refiero. as you can see, it's a theater, so we use actors, real actors. Voy a tocarte abajo para aumentar el flujo sanguíneo. I'm in the medium of COVID, ah, okay. we're very problematic at this point es. to create, mm -hmm. we create this kind of, moment of climax that way the user has to decide if the no, view no is correct he, she was harassed by the doctor or the view of the doctor is correct but he he thinks that he this was professional so this was the first the first season and we in which we create fiction it was very very complicated In the second, in the second, in the second season, we create El Inquisidor. It's a it's a fiction series, but it's gam it's gamified. This is the difference here. So basically, here you have a control panel. We put gamification, and it's about a series that it's killing woman basically, and the user has to discover who the killer is basically, who the murderer is. <clears throat> but here it's important that you register. Um, because if you are not able to register, you basically, you cannot access, access to the interactive mode in which you can access to, uh, I repeat, to a, to a panel of control in which you can, you have a ranking, you can unlock uh, strategic content, etc. So this was the second, but today I'm, we are analyzing nonfiction. And this, this next weekend on, on Sunday, although it's online several weeks ago, we are, we are launching these three season which is called um sorry which is called uh, ways of your ways of jordan caminos de jordan and basically here what we did is to create an interactive documentary which was the topic of the day and basically we selected the the the, the list
little village in, in the, here in, the, in Colombia, Jordan Sube. So we create this kind of montage, creating some kind of postcards. So it's in, it's in Spanish, but I can do that. Welcome to Jordan Sube. It's a village with people who resist and not live. Jordan was at the moment a good village, but now it's in a fragile reality, meaning in a fragile reality. Um, at one point, they had 1,000 inhabitants travel with us to this place. And then we have the Canyon del Chicamocha, which is a mountain there. We can start the trip. Once we start the trip, we have a, a video, which is like the an introduction, a little introduction, which says that it's a very little and isolated village, Jordan. We are arriving to the, to the with the, no inhabitants in the field, in the country field, basically. We record using drones and using, um, during two months. And basically, once we get to the end of this introduction, we get to a map. There is an onboarding as well with the several steps and some tips in order that you are a tourist, no? that here the role is important in interactivity. So we establish the role and approaching to the story, etc. So we have basically, we are returning like interactive documentary to a basic five linear stories. We are here, interactivity is, is only like short history of the, high, of the high rise. You can go deep, but it's not very like, it's not very, very strong, okay? So for example, we can go to this, we have five characters. We can choose, for example, Diego, who is musician, but have to work in the country field as well. So basically they are um, short documentary films of 15 till 20 minutes. And basically, me voy rumbo a mi vereda, me voy contento del pueblo a cumplir con mi labor. He vendido mis productos que con esfuerzo y esmero y el cariño de mis hijos cultivado en mi región. Basically, I have four points here. I can just go here in order. And I have some content which is basically in, in a second, in a second, uh, second layer. Now we can see one of them with, with, with the sun. Historia le sucede una amiga. expanded, and I can go deeper, basically, to another layer. Lamentablemente another video, ahí es donde la cultura uh, empieza that, pues, a decaer un poco. Y qué lástima que no apoyen eso, que es este es de acá, la tierrita. Es un, la música carreguera nació en Boyacá. Y afortunadamente ya está este... So basically what we saw in the previous... Este ni a otro y sin ya que estaba enferma. Once I just Muy come bien, back to esto. the mainstream of Diego, the main video, I can see here that, for example, at any time, I can just come um, to the map, to the main map, and I can see that the Diego is completed. I have to complete the five, and then in the end, I have a, I have a, a like a prize in the end, um, and a reward, which is basically, um, well, if you want to navigate, you can discover it's in Spanish. I don't know if you know Spanish, probably not very much, but it's worse because it's Colombian. So it's, 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 it's Spanish is complicated, but Colombian is sometimes very complicated. But if you want to give a try, I prefer not doing a spoiler. And basically you can see the stories are very, very, very nice. But I think that getting to the end of the session, what we did in El Cubo, I prefer to have more time to, to, to because you know it's three years invested here. It's uh, it's around one million dollar invested here in three seasons, which is a lot of money for a for an interactive project for each season. Not not one one million, but we have three hundred around three hundred dollars, three hundred thousand dollars for each season, which is for me it's a dream to have this capacity of doing something like this. There are more things. There are more iterations. But the good thing here behind is that there is a big effort behind, and I want to finish with that um, little presentation, which are basically nine slides, in which you can understand basically what to me is more important today. I mean, there is a lot of things for me, creating the cube, El Cubo, was a big challenge. I've never worked so hard in terms of script, in terms of 
um, design in terms of um, directing interactivity, because you know in the first season there's more than 500 um, interactivities. In the second one, we had to gamify 32 scenes, which were very difficult because I'm not expert in, even we have to hire an expert in gamification in that way to gamify this interactive series. And this was easier, but we worked very hard on the stories. We worked very hard in the narrative. So basically, to understand basically the cube, the cubo, because now we are creating like a tool in order to help you to create these stories or intertwine these stories, the key thing to me is understand um, who, are, who are the teams involved behind in a, such a project. Because normally, the, the problem is not about technology, which is technology, but on the other hand, is about the language, establishing a common language between different teams. Because in audiovisual or in literature, etc., and other fields, it's complicated, but you have to have a team of audiovisual production, editing production, post production, etc., script, etc. But here is more complicated. You have to have a design team and a coding team, a developer team. Okay. So basically, here we have a creative team, which was the head of the Kubo. Basically, we have three roles, which um, all the time are the same roles. Juan Baquero as creative director. Juan Baquero is the director of RTBC Play, of the streaming platform. Um, myself as interactive direction, and Camilo Galvez, who is a producer as well, who made the audiovisual interactive co-direction and help a lot in the process. And it, during each season, Teu de dos is temporada in Spanish. For each season, we hired a, a, a well-known, in the first season, Fabio Rubiano, who is a well-known dramaturgic um, director, Mauricio Navas, a producer in the second for the series, and Jose Baron, another director in the third one. The second big team of the El Cubo uh, is the production team, and we have several production, Pilar Covillos, Carolina Ponte, Margarita Herrera, Paula Arias, and the good thing here is that the budget came from the single fund for information and communications technologies of the Ministry of Technologies of Colombia. So we had no this problem of getting for the fund, because in order to get the fund, maybe you need, depending, but if you are producing in an independent production, you need maybe one, two, in, 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 the, in the best scenario, you need one or two years. In worst case scenario, you need from three till five years. And in that point, the 90% of the projects quit, finish, because it's, you are not able to get that fund. So here in that part, it's a public system television, and they bet on, on innovation, and we got this fund each year. We are developing the fourth season now, and probably we quit as well, and we finish with El Cubo, developing an app or some kind of tool in order to help to apply this kind of methodology. The third team is the audiovisual production team, which is the audiovisual production company. We had different production company alongside the, the three different seasons. If you have an audiovisual production team, you have a multimedia production team, we partner up with Interfaz, which is a studio multimedia in Colombia. Juan Marín, Andres Cano, José Tux. Basically, we need uh, one or two designers and four coders in order to do this code because you can do that in a low, uh, in a low strategy using, for example, very low Wix or Clint or some software. But when you have to code at this level, it's very complicated and, and you have to spend a lot of money in order to, to convey all this material. The five team involved is the social media team and, and marketing team from RTBC, is an inside, in-house team from, from the television, from the media public system television in Colombia. And the sixth faith of, of El Cubo is probably the audience. See, so we, if we don't have audience, we don't have El Cubo, okay? So in the end, all our strategies are trying to have time, as we talked with Costa before, trying to detect who is the main target of our project, which in nonfiction, we don't used to do that. But when you have one year and we have some resources, for the first time in my life, I had time to, to spend some time to thinking about the archetypical user of this experience, okay? Um, basically, um, we are doing an innovation in narrative in genres and formats. For example, uh, the power, we create an interactive or immersive essay. In El Inquisidor, we gamified an interactive fiction series. In Ways of Jordan, we create an interactive documentary film, which is more, more traditional. Um, we use six characters, so it's, it's our matrix. If we take this, this lens and we are just rolling up 
the cubo so we can see uh, the six names here being the, the last one of course the the, the village for dan Suga itself in the in this in this season it's not a character um, pleasure meet but it's uh, the village um, itself so basically um for me um that's all for today i'm a little bit tired now <laughs> explain and to think and to display so many things and to explain myself in English. For me, it's better in Catalan, Spanish, even Italian. But it has a pleasure to be here and, and we can make a short Q&A if you want. And, and thank you very much for your attention. We have five minutes, yeah, five minutes. Sure. We don't have anything from the space. internet, so we can start from the class. Sure. Thank you very much again, and the lectures are very fascinating. Um, I had the opportunity last night to look at Caminos de Jordan. Oh. Mr. Ivalio has kindly Thank sent you. us the link. Um, I have a question. It's, um, as you mentioned, it's a more traditional approach. It's five linear stories of five characters, the, the farmer, the priest, the musician, uh -huh. the fisherman, and so on. And you just follow them separately. Um, in a traditional documentary way, we would have two ways of approaching it. Either we make a mini series if we really want in depth in each character, or we make an intertwined documentary um, showing it some kind of storyline with all the characters entwined. So my question is a little bit provocative. Um, I know you're in, in, in investigating a new format of storytelling, but you have invested a lot of time and effort and money to make the cube. What in your view is the added value in relation to a more classical way of presenting this? Mm -hmm. well, I think that basically the cube is, a, is an excuse to reflect, to reflect as a society, basically, as a, even each, each traditional documentary could do as well. But the idea is that you can, you can shift the view at like, uh, we were inspired by Las Hijack, of course, but we, we were, were not able to do this kind of sophisticated, uh, sophisticated um, in, interactive um, interface. But I think that the, that the good thing that we did in El Cubo is like, in a feature documentary, in a linear documentary, you have to go, you can create a, a parallel montage between several characters, but you, can, you have to go one by one in the way that the author or the director is giving you the different. Here, you have interactivity and interactivity for us allows you to select or to change whatever you want. While in a traditional view, this is not so easy to do. You have to uh, follow the, the guidance of the author, of the, of the director. I think that this one of the things, maybe in the last one, in in Ways of Jordan, in, of Jordan, we realized that maybe as in interactive documentary, interactivity was too much for our user. So probably in the first season, people went to to El Cubo first season and say, okay, I'm lost. I'm lost inside this kind of net that we did. So in the in this third season, we tried to focus on the narrative and in the linear. So in the end, in life, you always try to make things more complicated, more complicated in general. And in the end of the day, you come back to the essential, which is basically story and narrative. I don't know how this worked, for example, but in the end, when uh, we see in metrics, we saw in metrics that when people uh, start playing Kubo and interactivity or something to do is, more com is, is quite complicated, like choosing a, a character, three modes of interactivity, what I have to do in each mode, there's a reward, what is the reward? We lost them. This is our like, and this is very concerning about what's happening inside when there's too much interactivity. So our evolution in El Cubo is getting to a point in which we, we look for more simplicity. And I think that is another part which could really um, help the users, and in the end, there's a reward. In a documentary, you have a call to action in the end, feature documentary. You have to go to a website, give some money, and make change.org, something. But here, in the in the projects, in the three seasons of the Cubo, you have uh, several rewards. 
So in the end, it's another stimulus for the user in order to get to the end of the story. There's another uh, different thing in that way of, of projects. Okay, um, I have, I think that Costa has a class now. So I think he's he's seeing me very like, mm -hmm. like saying, <laughs> no, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. But I think that we should we should finish because I want to be a friend of Costa in the for for coming years, <laughs> especially this night because we share autumn. So I think it's time to quit. But it has been a pleasure. I will be around the whole day today. I will come back for sure. And Igliki will come to Spain because we start doing some some clear business together. So we will be in touch, and I can help you. Here you have my email from the University of of Autonomous. You can write me whatever you want. And my personal website, take a look if you want, and don't worry, we will be in touch. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.